Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. He's speaking to us from Vancouver. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, hi, Jim. Good to be with you and with our listeners out there in artificial intelligence land. Well, what was your definition of artificial intelligence? Oh, I used to use it years ago. And it was when they took a guy with a Ph.D. in interventionist economics and appointed him as head of the Fed. And he instantly had reputation and genius like you wouldn't believe. So I, I used to call that artificial intelligence. Of course, you could also bring in the Peter Principle where you're promoted to your point of incompetence. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was a wonderful... That guy was very good with his talking about it and his books about it. I think that was the early 60s or something like that. And, and the strange thing is we've all had managers where you've wondered, how the hell did they get that job and how do they keep it? Right. Yeah, well, I haven't worked very much in a hierarchical system, so I've been essentially free of that, So, uh, but I know that it exists, so... Well, I've worked for general managers, program directors, and news directors who I wondered, how can they walk, talk, and chew gum at the same time? (laughs) Yeah. And yet the people, I think they keep their jobs because they have brilliant people under them. And despite the bad management policies and practices, the radio station or TV station is still successful. Yeah, I think you got a point there, Jim. Yeah, Jim. Hire good talent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Some of the headlines that we're taking a look at today, the one that really caught both of our eyes is the stock market is seeing one of the strongest first quarters of the post-war era. Why is the stock market so hot, Bob? Well, it's just hot. And and, uh, and the post-war era, I'm thinking they're talking about back to World War II, which is a very long time. Now, we got set up for this in October we pointed out that the markets were setting up that, oh, it was uraniums and the Bitcoin were setting up for a, one of those strong rallies that can run right through until January. And then I think a couple of days later, noticed that the S&P was in that pattern as well. So that's been our view that, that it could have a very strong rally right out until January. And we got to January and said, hey, this is all so strong, it could continue into, you know, at least through March, which uh, it's, yeah, hey, the S&P had a, is, is setting a high, and the action is not quite really overdone on the upside. So, but there's been groups like the Magnificent Seven that have done some pretty straight ups, and and a few weeks ago, I saw an individual stock that really was straight up and then the other way, but I unfortunately can't find it. So, But we are in highly speculative conditions. The euphoria for the stock market is amazing, and it's, people are not just buying equity risk, but they're also buying risk in the credit markets. The uh, junk bonders have been acting reasonably well. Uh, at close to highs. So there is um, complete euphoria out there for anything that moves, and some of it is pretty risky. And as I said, the the action in the S&P is beginning to get overdone, but not quite there yet. And the action in, in the, uh, the compulsion to buy risk is just 
just amazing. So, uh, uh, well, that's the, you know, that's the, that's the big stuff now. And uh, it we don't know, but uh, there's the seasonality out to around now. And then after mid-year, you can have a seasonality when things go wrong, like commodities go down, uh, credit spreads widen. And if there's going to be a crisis in the financial markets, that would begin to appear in the latter part of September. So uh, yeah, it sort of looks steady for the next few months with the understanding that the rush to buy has been remarkable, and, and the headline really says it. That's, uh, that's, re- that's something. So, Are we truly setting up for a sell in May, go away? That's a very good saying, and it's been around for a while. Uh, as I said, this kind of a move can can peak in March or April or May. As I said, it's not quite there now. Maybe, maybe Jim, your sell in May and go away will be the effective line for this year. Of course, that used to be on the premise, too, that people had summer holidays coming up. There wouldn't be much trading but with uh, bots doing the trading now and AI poking its nose in, uh, uh, trading's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's, it's remarkable. But it's still uh, the ultimate decision to buy or sell is done by people. And oftentimes the extremes are mo- motivated by fear uh, as get me out or greed as in get me in. So... And then the other one, what's the other one? I forget what it is, but you, the fear, oh, FOMO, fear oh. of missing out. That was the other one, yeah. Well, that would be uh, what drives Bitcoin, I would think. Oh, Bitcoin is pure market fury. That's what it's about. Uh, and, uh, well, our, our tools are, we're, we're, we try to find the overbots and the oversolds on that one. But it is also part of, an essential part of the bull market. So getting the next high or the high on this one move is going to be important, which we will be, you know, checking uh, virtually every day. Check the technicals on both the S and P and and the Bitcoin. One of the theories I heard is, despite gold and silver going up right now, people aren't getting into the uh, gold juniors or explorers yet. Still, even though the possibility of a huge breakthrough is there, and the theory is the money that would have gone into those speculative uh, spaces has gone into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency. Yeah, that's a thought. Uh, But we uh, sort of uh, have an interest in small cap gold stocks. You can buy the big ones and you're going to get the market move. But in order to amplify it, you've got to get leverage, and leverage isn't really a good idea. So a way to make some good percentage gains has been in the the very depressed uh, junior golds. And we've got a list of about, oh, 10 or 11 of them. And we did this thing with a list of five of them many years ago. And one of them turned out to be Arequipa, and that went to $30. So, you know, you get one of those. So the ideal thing is to uh, take a look at our list of juniors and I would just, you know, blanket buy them. Uh, then one or two may just sit there as turkeys, but all you need is uh, most of them probably rally and a percent gain that would be uh, only accomplished in buying the seniors with leverage. So you, this thing, you're unleveraged. You got about 10 or 11 uh, carefully selected junior gold stocks, and the percent gains could be pretty good. And you might get stuck with one that goes to zero, but eh, the risk re- reward on this on this concept uh, I rather like. So now, you, know. you mentioned the word Turkey. Uh, let's the country of Turkey has upped their central bank rate to fifty percent. Whoa! I didn't see that. That is oh they got or their a, inflation they got is a, running at fifty percent. I I think. Yeah, and I'm going, really? They'll pay you 50% if you put your money in a oh, Turkish they've bank? they've got a serious problem with their currency then. Yeah. One should have, I will we'll take a look at that. Yeah, no, that's that's a, that's really serious. 
I know the the number is incredible, but then you look at Argentina, where inflation's running at roughly one hundred and forty percent, I think, uh, and and yeah. what they pay you on a bank deposit is tremendous as well. But yeah. of course, when you take that money out, it's still not worth anything. Yeah, well, it's like the uh, the paper and the the printing of banknotes, currency in nineteen twenty two, twenty three, in the Weimar. Republic in Germany. No, that really was. The people were going around with wheelbarrows full of money and getting paid about three times a day because they would then convert the uh, their their cash payments to uh, cigarettes or you know anything that was real. And uh, then uh, I think it was in November 1923 when the the banking authority, treasury authorities, or whatever they had at the time, decided, oh, enough of that. And uh, quit just like that. Yeah, so well, the, the that hyperinflation in Germany was deliberate. And there's even quotes I've seen from uh, high-priced economists at the time saying that uh, no, it needs to have more inflation. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that was a crazy one, and it destroyed uh, the finances of Germany and made the whole country vulnerable to. Extreme politics that followed destroyed the middle classes. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm just looking at a, a headline here: Turkey Central Bank raises interest rate to 50 percent from 45, citing the continuing need to counter climbing inflation. Yeah. Wow. And the climbing inflation is they're printing too many of their currency notes, and they're heading down in price, and inflation goes up, and interest rate goes up. Isn't that amazing? We have a headline here. Goldman Sachs says commodities to benefit as central banks cut rates. Yeah, now this one is really tricky because short-dated interest rates such as T-bills, they go up in a boom. And then the Federal Reserve uh, in actually follows the increase in, in, in short rates driven by market forces and raise their Fed rate. And then it sort of stalls out where it is now, and the street starts talking about Fed cuts. <laughs> we run the charts, and whatever the T-bill, well, the key is the T-bill rate. And looking at the six months, it set its high in August, declined, and then is on a, a little rise here now. But what uh, will... What, what has happened in the past is the T-bill rate heads down, the Fed follows it with Fed cuts, and the markets go all to hell. So, uh, And yet, at, before you get that transition, the street gets all excited because they think with rates going down, things will go up. And I've got a wonderful quote by a guy at one of the big firms in New York in September of 2007 saying that interest rates are going to go down, the Fed will cut, and it will certainly help the stock market. Well, the uh, that stock market high was in October, and the economy peaked in that December, and then everything headed south. So, But, but uh, I make a note of these ones, Jim, that where the, the uh, headlines now are that rates are going to go down and how, that'll help the market. But in all examples in the, any any part of history, is that when the rates go down after a boom, it's usually in a disaster. So, well, uh, on this week in money, uh, released on Saturday, uh, a guest Wolf Richter noted that services inflation in the U.S. is still super high, and he thinks the Fed perhaps will only cut once this year. Because inflation, it's not the official yeah. inflation figure, but he said uh, for goods and services, uh, hotels, air travel, and so on, yeah. there's still 7%. 7 oh, yeah, no, it, it is still going on, but I'm watching the commodity prices, and if they fail, then the, uh, then the inflation in services and all that will fail as well. So, no, I'm just watching and... Uh, uh, he, uh, Wolf is mentioning that uh, the Fed may do one cut, but uh, once it is in the hands of uh, market forces, Mother Nature is running the show, 
And when the T-bill rate heads down, it'll be a trend change, and the Fed will have no choice to follow but to follow, and we'll do many, many cuts until it gets down to almost zero. <laughs> the T-bill's going to go to almost zero, and the, the Fed rate will go to almost zero, but it'll be in a market disaster. That's the part that's difficult to get across. Because everybody is so programmed to think that when rates go down, wonderful things will happen. Nuh-uh, not so. Well, Japan has had negative interest rates now for decades. They finally uh, moved them up to zero. And with the yen at a three-decade low, they say drastic measures will have to be taken. What? You bring interest rates above zero? <laughs> well, actually, the uh, in the U.S., the 10-year rate real... It's gone from something like minus 0.40% to, oh, two and a half. So let's call it a three percentage point increase in the real 10-year yield. And it's, you know, the rise in rates has been discussed and as being painful. But on previous uh, post-bubble contractions, and I've done the work years ago, the typical increase in real long rates has been in the order of 10 percentage points, which in each case has been the ultimate disaster. Mother Nature's way of reforming recklessness in the credit markets, that's either by individual speculators or speculators at the central banks. So this thing, when it comes in, and I believe it will, it's going to be very interesting. So Jim, at some point, maybe over the next couple of months, that T, the six-month T-bill rate will set a downtrend, and then we will really get excited about that when it comes. Now, how long is it usually that uh, the U.S. sees a recession after the yield curve inverts? Oh, that one is difficult. Uh, I've got them for the top of 1929. And in the previous bubble, 1873, and the yield curve in each case <laughs> reversed or inverted at the end of the year, and the stock market in each case had peaked in September. So it's the timing on the yield curve uh, inverting is elusive. And we know that it inverted in March 2022, didn't it? Yeah. Or was it 23? I don't remember. Maybe 23. But it hasn't done, hasn't been followed by any particular damage. So it was maybe in market oddity. And you've got the strength in the economy, which could be fading, but the strength in the economy has been due, as, as we've been explaining it, to many people trying to get back to normal after the COVID lockdown. And then maybe even. You know, bringing in 10 million illegal inter immigrants into the U.S. is is a, a buoyant item for the stock market. Who knows? But it ain't, or for the economy. But the economy is okay. But you get headlines about a sudden plunge in some series or a sudden crash in another series. So there's uh, it's it's becoming a little. A little uh, vulnerable out there, and I'm going to stick with watching the six-month T-bill. That'll tell us when the next contraction's about to happen. Bob, do you expect a lot of market manipulation to support the White House going into the November election? Oh, yeah. I think the Fed uses any excuse to accommodate the financial markets, and it doesn't matter whether it's Republicans or Democrats in the White House, they're there to make the sunshine. And uh, who knows if they can still... You know, the sun isn't going to shine unless it wants to. And if the Fed is doing something when the sun's shining, it looks like cause and effect, doesn't it? But uh, no, no. I, we, we just watch the commodity index. If it breaks down, that's bad news. And the the six-month T-bill, if it rolls over and heads down, that should be considered as bad news as well. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts. 
radio and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Let's go behind the bamboo curtain. Country <laughs> Garden, Vankay, to expose extent of China's property crisis. Yeah, ever. Yeah, these names. Grande as well. What was Country Garden, and then there was Evergrande, and we'll see these names for quite a while. But it that is uh, was a crazy, immense bubble in a in a country that is a very brief uh, financial history. So uh, it's but bubbles are so com- so compelling, even to countries with a long financial history. Uh, everybody gets crazy, and then you have the problem. So, yeah, uh, well, I think we'll see <laughs> Evergrande and Country Gardens name frequently on as their contraction continues. Headline from the Fashion Network News. Well, it's not often we quote them. Yeah. Gucci's China shock reverberates across luxury landscape. Yeah, uh the uh, the one, part of the story was that suddenly people in China are are not buying Gucci jewelry and watches and stuff like that. So it reminds me of the story many years ago when I was skiing. I got a pair of special leather. I had a leather shop make up a spare special uh, wrist straps for the ski poles. Nice colored leather. And then embossed on it was Gucci, only it was spelled G-U-C-H-I rather than the C-C-I or however they spell it. So I had some fun with that for a while. My solution to Whistler where people are wearing $3,000 ski suits was buy a nylon running shell to put over my sweatpants that cost me 10 bucks. <laughs> and, and there you go, I got a ski yeah. suit. And oh, no, I always well. wore the proper uh, ski clothes at the time, you know, whenever. So, yeah. Yeah, oh, well, part of that uh, downturn in China as well, Canada Goose, a luxury clothing maker, yeah. with uh, super warm jackets, but they cost a grand or more. And yeah. they're laying off 17% of their workforce. Oh, so it's even hitting sale, sales products like that. Yeah, yeah, they may be talking about a strong economy. But underneath it, there are areas where it's a disaster. And thanks for pointing that one out, Jim, about the uh, the da- eider down clothes in Canada, so goose or whatever it is. Yeah, Canada, yeah, Canada goose. Yeah. Well, it's real goose down. Uh, the fakes, of course, have just chicken feathers in them, and they're they absorb water, and you'll freeze to death. Oh yeah, else. yeah. Now, another headline. China's- You'd be feeling a little down in the mouth, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> headline, China's zombie car plant problem. Oh, Yeah. Those poor zombies. Zombie cars are regular cars, internal combustion engines. I had to look it up. And then the other hand, you've got the craziness for uh, EVs, electric. Well, let's call them battery-powered yeah. vehicles. And they are about to become, well, they're, they're, they peaked. The mania for EVs peaked, and it's rolling over. And the amount of money wasted in setting up plants to build EVs and wasted in putting together all of the resources to build one of these things, and then they're not going to be used. It, it, this is This is... An incredible uh, economics disaster, and it's... Well, I'm glad I'm around to watch it play out. Uh, another uh, headline that caught your eye, Banks' massive debt surge brings its own set of dangers. Yeah, they've been... With, along with the uh, effervescence in the public, in the credit markets, of course, the banks have been lending it out hand over fist. And as you know, the old saying is that they put a, give you umbrellas when the sun's shining, and as soon as the clouds come, they call in the umbrellas. And that's that's true, I'm telling you. Headline, massive squeeze lifts small caps into month end. Small caps haven't been doing all that well until lately. Yeah, it's just, whoa, here we go. And as you point out, it's it it may complete in April, but it's, it's a sell in May <laughs> and go away situation. So... 
And yeah, uh, and then there's been one. I saw one a few weeks ago, and I can't remember what it was, but my God, it really was a huge straight up, and then an immense straight down. But uh, if you look at the Magnificent Seven, they uh, they've had a straight up, uh, but are not and have had a, a a correction, but nothing serious there yet. We'll end the show like the way I like to end my evening, Coco. Yeah. Coco prices hit $10,000 for the first time ever. Oh, yeah. I ran the chart, and the, the up here at this level, on a 20-year chart, it's never been anywhere near that. More like 4000 on, on a number of highs, but uh, up here at 10000 straight up. But now you read about Coco, and they had a rains when they didn't need them, and then they had a blight that uh, was serious and anyways it's there's a, a huge production loss of cocoa and and there we are with another commodity that goes straight up fantastic it is bob when you eat your chocolate easter bunny do you eat it ears or feet first <laughs> i used to begin with the ears now, with the high price of chocolate, you'll, you'll have to be just nibbling on the hairs of the ears to make it last. <laughs> yeah. The hairs of the hairs. The hairs of the hairs, yeah. Okay. Bob, have a great Easter. You too, Jim, and we look forward to getting together next week. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy, the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. If you have any questions for Bob, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on X at House Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of House Street Media Incorporated.